afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Han Sok Song, or Han Song. I'm a, a computational biologist at University of Nebraska, Nebraska Lincoln. And I, uh, or I'm a former PNNS scientist, and then I moved to Lincoln a year ago, and I'm really excited to continue my collaboration with uh, PNNL teams, including SBL, SOIL, SFA, and then IDS Photoshop team. I'm also glad to contribute to this exciting uh, summer school program uh, by lecture and tutorial sessions. And first of all, sorry about the showing some scientific diagram and the equation from the first slide. Um, but this is actually core of my talk. So you can see here that the catabolism, anabolism, and then their combination and metabolic reaction. Also, you can see the bottom there, the rotation or pyramidal lambda. So lambda is a thermodynamic parameter I'll talk about uh, later, but um, usually the modeler has a freedom to define or change their variable while they are making uh, computer codes, but I couldn't do it because the lambda, this thermodynamic theory is known as lambda theory. So therefore, I don't have any freedom to change this uh, uh, parameter. Anyway, just remember that lambda is a core thermodynamic parameter, then I'll, I'll dig into it soon. First of all, why? Uh, I'm talking about today uh, substrate explicit modeling. The answer can be given by looking at the biogeochemical side on the left. So in addition to the microorganisms, micro um, like uh, animals, plants, and human beings also contribution of microorganisms to biochemical is significant. They um, synthesize and secrete extracellular enzyme to break down complex organic matters to simple organic compounds. And then uh, microbial community, microbial organisms work together as a community by building a collaborative relationship, convert these organic carbons and compounds into inorganic minerals, and then the cycle goes on. So we can extract three key factors that drive this biochemical cycle. First thing is microbes, of course, and also the enzymes. The enzymes are important to break down complex carbon to simpler, and also substrate. Therefore, uh, to make our model, or biogeochemical model, predictive, is important to account for these three key factors and then account for their dynamic interplay. That is a key for making our model more predictive. And, and this importance has been recognized in earlier models, but at a very simple level, at a lumped level. So this is not really simplification, but if you look at the earlier uh, approaches that they have a one component for a complex carbon, and then another variable, simple carbon and enzyme and the microbes. And this is a great model and there's a lot of science question we can address by this model. However, still uh, this model composed of lumped variables, we cannot use this model to identify control points or bottleneck in this cycle. And another issue with using this model is that we are flooded with molecular data and then the utility of this molecular data, omics data, or other types of advanced data for informing predictable modeling is one of the issues or of a topic in this summer school. But um, there are huge gaps between this simple, simple model and then the resolution that molecular data we are handling. Therefore, this model is not very useful to interpret this molecular data and similarly, this model are not very effective for parameterizing this model. So we have a, we have a better model in the, in, 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 the, in the sense that we need to increase the resolution of these three components. And there has been consensus on the importance of increasing the resolution on microbial part. And then that led to so-called microbially explicit modeling. This is a cool concept and then uh, so modern approach of microbial, microbial explicit modeling, they take 16 sRNA, more metagenomes, makes a these are potential input data to parameterize this type of model. And in this model, we identify distinct contribution or function, their biochemical function of individual species or their functional guilds. So what groups of organisms are, 
oxidizing uh, ammonium or the how they are involved in nitrogen cycle, something like that. In parallel, also there has been a method termed enzyme-based model or enzyme explicit modeling. And um, this model then we uh, define and then parameterize and then distinct the role of distinct enzymes. So in the example right hand side here, and this is a denitrification pathways, and then several steps are individual steps are catalyzed by distinct enzymes. NAVE, NRG, first, first step, and NARC, S, NRK, second step, NOR, and NAS, and, and so forth. So, uh, this model is useful for collectively describing uh, biogeochemical reactions performed by microbial community, and metatrinsic data or proteomic data are useful data for parameterizing this model. What is missing, though, still, is substrate part. So, so uh, this oversimplification will not only the uh, decrease the predictive power of a biogeochemical model, also it'll uh, negatively affect the further elaboration of microbially explicit model or enzyme explicit model because these models necessarily involve this uh, uh, metabolic meta substrate transformation pathways. So then uh, having this component properly and then accounting for their resolution properly is very important. And then we have this, this type of model, so-called the substrate explicit modeling takes the metabolic data as a key input. So metabolomics is a relatively new class to omics uh, data, and then, but this nickname is uh, super glue, and it can be combined with transcriptomic data or the proteomic data and genomic data. They are provided some evidences of chemical function, biochemical function, but metabolic data tell us what is really happened. Therefore, they can combine to, uh, to inform biochemical model together as a complete set. And for those who attended yesterday's session, then uh, may look at this figure and this is overview. And then today, what I'm going to go over is that this part. So I'll talk about, start from the chemical formula of compounds. And then in the morning, the Bob talked about how to process FDI cell data and to uh, generate chemical formula. So what I'm going to talk about is how thermodynamic theory can play a role in deriving uh, stoichiometric reactions and also kinetic equations, and then how do you can, you can use them for uh, batch and CSTL simulations. And I'll be talking about how, what tools are available and how uh, we made this uh, uh, implementable in K-Base. So I think there are two key steps. First, conversion of a chemical formula to stoichiometric reactions here. Then I'll be talking about the figure you have already seen in the first slide. And the second, uh, from stoichiometric reaction to kinetics. And I talk about transition theory for microbial growth. So I don't think uh, the theory I'm uh, discussing today is really new because this, is, this has been discussed in um, uh, different key references I'm showing here. And what I did is I just uh, understood these theories and then put them together and then apply them to our FDICL data for eventually for application to reactive transport models. And then uh, for those who are interested in uh, understanding the theories in detail, please look at these three key references. Also, um, what I'm presenting today is available as a preprint in bioarchive bottom there. So first part is to convert molecular formula to stoichiometric reactions. So here, the subscript A, B, C, D to Z are called elemental composition, but also called elemental stoichiometry. But uh, the stoichiometry I'm talking about is a reaction stoichiometry. In this case, I mean the coefficient here, YSI, 
uh, is a reaction stoichiometry. And then you may not very familiar with why I'm showing here as an equation, because reactions are not equations. You may uh, think like that, but equations are not equations. Reactions are typically written as this form, like a 2A plus B goes to 3C, means that two moles of A react with one mole of a B to produce, produce three moles of a C. But in order to handle a large number of compounds, it is beneficial to write them as equations by using plus minus signs. So here at the bottom below, so here minus sign represent consumption and the plus sign represent production. So same meaning. Therefore, here, this is reaction. This is a complete reaction I want to use as the stoichiometric reactions for uh, respiration, uh, oxidative respiration. And then you can take this as a template equation. Why template? Because we already have a key components here, organic carbon, water, and bicarbonate, ammonium, hydrogen phosphate, and hydrosulfide, hydrogen ion, electron, oxygen, and biomass. Biomass, so I already predefined the composition of a biomass here. And this is a specific example. We have, I, I have a question of the glucose, acetate, and glucose. I mean, and they are chemical formula like this. And then chemical formula can be given as a vector or table or matrix like that. And using uh, our goal is to determine these stoichiometric coefficients here. For glucose, acetate, and glucose, I mean, and then you, you may notice here then the final equation is normalized with respect to biomass. Therefore, the meaning of this is the what is the stoichiometric relationship among these compounds to produce one mole of a biomass. But here, so one mole of biomass contains one carbon mole. Therefore, we can say also. This is stoichiometric relationships among compounds to produce one carbon mole of a biomass. And then here is again minus sign of the consumption. So for glucose, to, in order for produce one carbon mole of a biomass, 0.34 mole of glucose should be consumed. And 0.2 ammonium mole of ammonium should be consumed. And then also oxygen should be consumed. Interesting comparison is that glucosamine. It's glucose and glucose are very similar structurally and elementary, but it has a nit organic nitrogen in glucosamine. And then uh, you can see here ammonium is not consumed in this reaction, it's pro produced if we take glucosamine as organic carbon, because it has only nitrogen in, in the chemical formula. And so, there are some basic vocabularies that I uh, that we need to know in understanding the uh, metabolic reaction. First of all, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is a reaction to generate energy. And this energy is, is used by anabolic reaction to biomass. So, but for cat catabolic reactions, we use the term electron donors and acceptors. These are called the substrates. For anabolism, instead of electron donors or acceptor, we use carbon source and nitrogen source. What carbon source and nitrogen should be specified to define biomass? And if you are familiar with the metabolic network and catabolic pathways generate ATP as energy molecules. This ATP generated from catabolic pathways are uh, transferred to anabolic pathways for synthesis of biomass. And there are certain amount of ATP is just dissipated. So it's called maintenance or non gross associated maintenance term. So this is just dissipation of energy for maintenance. And then production of ATP from catabolism should cover both this ATP for anabolism and then maintenance. But we don't have a metabolic network model. We just have, sorry about that. We have just substrate and then their chemical formulas and organic carbons. So instead of ATP, we can uh, formulate the model based on their Gibbs thermodynamic functions such as Gibbs free energy. So actually these two formulations are equal except ATP is replaced by 
the delta G or Gibbs free energy. So catabolism generates energy in the form of Gibbs free energy. And this energy is consumed by anabolism. And then certain amount of uh, energy is dissipated. Same, same structure. And then by, in, in both cases, we can define metabolic reaction by combining catabolic and anabolic reactions. And so how we can combine them? We combine them for energy balance. So energy should be balanced out such that so um, all the energy produced by catabolism should be uh, satisfy the requirement for one carbon monoxide source dissipation energy. Therefore, this lambda is a key role. Lambda represents how many times catabolic reaction should run to produce energy required for the synthesis of one carbon mole of a biomass. I'm getting some uh, questions, but uh, I'll have a Q&A time at the, um, at the end of this lecture. And, but also uh, we have to know what is the meaning of delta G and then uh, spontaneous reaction versus a non-spontaneous reaction. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, a process occurs in the increasing direction of a total entropy of the universe. And total entropy of the universe is summation of entropy of a system and then entropy of surroundings. So, Thermodynamics to me is a, like authoritative science. If it says yes, it should be yes. If it's true, it should be true. It doesn't matter how I think. So it's very authoritative and it's great. I, I understand that uh, everything occurs, including biogenical reactions spontaneously if, and if the total entropy of universe increases. However, I don't know how to calculate total, total entropy of the universe. And then alternatively, the chemist identified a determined spontaneity based on Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs free energy at constant time and temperature, the definition of Gibbs free energy is, is this, enthalpy minus T delta S. And if the Gibbs free energy is represent the energy change difference in energy status between reactants and products, and then figure uh, left, bottom left, shows that reactants energy level was here. And then uh, after reaction, and then the energy level got down. Therefore, there's a difference between reactants and the products, delta G in this case minus, this is spontaneous. The opposite case, delta G is positive sign, is non-spontaneous. It's called exergonic left-hand side and endergonic. And then delta G is negative, is we, we call them thermodynamically favorable, this is a minus sign, and plus sign thermodynamically unfavorable. And then I'll talk about the first part, catabolism, and then I'll move to the anabolism and then catabolic uh, react, metabolic reaction and, and subsequently. And there are some equations and there are some uh, mathematics, but this mathematics is very uh, simple. Uh, operators is just uh, multiplication, division, and addition and subtraction. So don't be scared by this equation, just a simple uh, mathematical operation, just I'll talk about. So all D here is that reaction for electron donor. So it's called, the first, this is again, template equation for electron donor half reaction. There's no biomass, just electron is here, depend. So by, by saying I, this RD electron donor, meaning that this sign of YD, E minus is positive. And electron donor equation generate electron, electrons, and this is consumed by electron acceptor equation. So in our case, electron acceptor is oxygen. Finally, electron acceptor is oxygen, and oxygen is consumed and together with hydrogen ion and then it requires four moles of electron. And then this is determined already, and it has nothing to do with the, in our choice of organic carbon. But electron donor equation, half reaction, really depends on what, what is our structure, chemical uh, elemental structure of organic carbon. Anyway, whatever it is, and then our goal is to combine these two such that uh, electrons are, there's no net production or consumption of electrons. 
therefore the formula is here and then we finally will get the reaction for catabolic reaction and then also we can represent as an equation so example same example and i have a glucose and then acetate and glucosamine and here this is yb and then ya is y is stoichiometric coefficient by bold it means that this is a factor of stoichiometric coefficients so and as you can see here, this reaction can be represented by this vector for each three cases. It doesn't matter what we choose for organic carbon, electron acceptor equation remains the same. Therefore, it has the same stoichiometry for three cases. And the, but electron donor equation changes like that. So depending on their structure, it has a different consumption, more of consumption of water and other components. And then we buy based on this equation or just by uh, combining them such that elect net production or consumption of electron is not uh, there. So we'll obtain finally this uh, equation. This is catabolic reaction. You can see still there is no biomass because this is catabolic. And then here, a uh, mole of the stoichiometric coefficient for electron is zero now. Previously, it was not zero. It was production of moles or 24, 8, 24, but now it's zero by combining electron application. Okay, then uh, anabolic reaction is a little bit tricky um, because, so there's template equation, template equation for anabolic reaction, but you can see still this anabolic reaction uh, can contain like electron production or consumption depending on their oxidative state state between the, the, the carbon source and the biomass. So this figure actually represents that. So in the template equation for anabolic reaction, if this reaction generates electron, it should be combined with the electron, electron acceptor equation. In the other case, if the, the template equation for uh, anabolic reaction really requires energy, uh, electron, then it should be combined with electron donor equation for electron balance. So this is another um, form, but, but all, all template equations are very similar to each other. But I put here uh, asterisk and represent this is not final form, this is an intermediate form. And then very similar, but it, now it has a one mole of biomass because this is anabolic reaction. Then how many so reactions or moles of organic carbon and other components are required? I can, you can calculate that. But here, this term, electron term, may not be zero. Then we have to, depending on the sign of electron, here our coefficient, stoichiometric coefficient of electron, we may, uh, we have to combine either electron donor equation or acceptor equation. And in, in these three cases here, if you look at the A, Y, A, and start this intermediate form of anabolic reaction, here a coefficient, this documented coefficient of electron are all minus. Therefore, meaning that this reaction should be combined with electron donor equation. And then this is a final form. So by combining them, now you can see the zero uh, stoichiometric coefficients for electrons and then this is the final form of anabolic reaction. Anabolic reaction, again, is defined for the synthesis of one carbon mole of a biomass. And so now I'll talk about the combination of a catabolic and anabolic reaction. And so this lambda plays a role in Lambda represent how many uh, lambda is determined such that the energy production from catabolic reaction is balanced out by the consum the re energy requirement and dissipation energy. So lambda represent how many again how many uh, times catabolic reaction should run to provide energy required for the synthesis of one carbon mole of biomass. So this is a uh, Y cat this catabolic reaction we already got this table in the previous slide and then anabolic reaction in here. And uh, lambda, in order to determine lambda, we have to look at their delta G uh, functions. Delta G for catabolic reaction, three cases, glucose acetate, glucosamine is there. 
and then dissipation energy, and then anabolic reaction here. And interestingly, this case, glucose, anabolic reaction is already minus, it's spontaneous. Therefore, but however, dissipation is, is significantly large, and therefore, still the catabolic reaction should provide the energy and to, to satisfy that energy requirement. And then this is a resulting value of lambda. And then lambda is a metric of a thermodynamic, what to say, inefficiency, because the higher value of lambda represents thermodynamically inefficient. So in, in, in these three cases, the acetate is a, shows that highest value of lambda is thermodynamically less favorable. And then so glucose and glucosamine show relatively lower value of lambda. They are thermodynamically, thermodynamically more fav favorable than acetate. And this is a final form of stoichiometric equation. And you can see, again, ammonium is an interesting component because glucose, then still it requires ammonium as a nitrogen source because minus sign is consumption. But glucosamine, it doesn't take ammonium as a nitrogen source because it already contains nitrogen in glucosamine here. And then it gen actually it generates ammonium. And this is the final form of uh, electron the metabolic reaction. And now you can check uh, your understanding and by following these individual steps. This is summary of uh, of the process of deriving metabolic reactions from the chemical uh, formula of organic carbon, we can start from the, the to the from the right. Metabolic reaction is a combination of catabolic and anabolic reaction, and a catabolic reaction is a combination of electron donor and acceptor reaction, and then um, the anabolic reaction also uh, start from given a uh, template reaction for anabolism, and then depending on their generation or consumption of electron, it may have to combine with electron donor or acceptor equation. So next part, second part is how to derive the kinetics. And then uh, this theory comes from this paper and uh, the, the authors considered transition state of microorganisms and then M is a microbe, and then the energy state of M is here. And then by taking energy from environment, then uh, microbe becomes energetically excited. And then when they are arrive in excited state and represented by X double dagger, they are ready to divide into two donor cells. And one parameter they introduced here is harvest volume, is the volume that microbes get access to, to harvest energy from environment. And they derived the equation like this, the growth rate or production of a biomass rate is, it depends on their energy uh, ratio and the harvest volume and then concentration of substrate. And uh, this actually defines lambda, and then also for they extended the equation for multiple substrate. In our case, organic carbon, and the second substrate is oxygen as electron acceptor. They said uh, this equation can be extended to include multiple components here: organic carbon and, and oxygen. And then this YOCI and YO2I is stoichiometric coefficient. They are fully determined by the thermodynamic theory I talked about in previous slides. And this is may not the form that you are already familiar with, because you may be more familiar with the Michaels methane kinetics. And then here, uh, this is a typical sigmoidal curve uh, relationship between growth rate and then glucose content, the substrate concentration. And overall, they look very similar to each other. And these are experimental data. And it is fitting to those data from uh, thermodynamics uh, derived kinetics versus methyl kinetics. Not very different, but the difference is here showing that uh, methyl kinetics show that growth rate can monotonically increase as the concentration of substrate increases. However, this kinetics, new kinetics, shows that, oh, if 
the cupsex concentration is below a certain threshold, then the cell cannot utilize them. So cell is not very much interested uh, in using them and their concentration is below a certain threshold. If we know the growth rate uh, or production rate of biomass, it is possible to derive the other reaction rates by their stoichiometric relationships. So actually this reaction represents whenever one, actually this is one, so whenever one mole of biomass, how many moles of organic carbon and other components need to be consumed or produced. Therefore, for example, the reaction uh, oxygen consumption rate is just we multiply that uh, stoichiometric coefficients of YO2 in, the, in front of biomass and organic carbon the same and ammonium the same. But in the case of ammonium, the sign of ammonium production or consumption will depend on their chemical structure of organic carbon. And, and this kinetics has a, 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 to determine this kinetic uh, equation or reaction rate, we need to determine what is the mu max. Mu max is maximal growth rate constant, and then VH harvest volume, and then organic carbon concentration and oxygen concentration. And then we apply this theory to, to analyze our experimental data. And these are two sites so along the Columbia River. This is the north site and the south here. And also you can see different density of trees. North has a less vegetated. South has, has more densely vegetated. And their respiration rates were different. And South has a higher level of biogeochemical activities. We call them as hot. A high activity zone or a hot spot, and those is low activity zone. And Amy Graham, Emily Graham et al., and they collected the omics data and analyzed them and compared to these two sites, and they were not very different between two two sites. Phylogenetically, the microbial composition and abundances were very similar, and their metagenome functions were not very different. That's a proteomics either, but so there, these two sites were primarily discriminated by metabolomics data. And then this difference is more clearly shown in this figure. And these are blue and red represent, represent north and south. And then there are a specific group of metabolites that are only contained in south side or hot, high activity uh, zone. So that includes amino sugar, lignin, lipid, and protein. And amino sugar and proteins are the compounds that contain nitrogens, therefore. So South has a, like organic nitrogen compounds are there, but these compounds are not found from those sample. And we got FDICR data from these two sites and then performed and then thermodynamic analysis. And this is a lambda comparison between low activity and high activity. You can see that high activity shows a little lower value of lambda. And then you can see that difference more clearly by looking at their distribution in this bar chart. And then low high activity and or south side has a larger portion of compounds that have a, have a lower value of lambdas. Again, low value lambdas represent thermodynamically more favorable and higher value of lambda represent thermodynamically less favorable. So it's clearly that higher high activity zone or south zone has a larger portion of compound that has uh, a lower value of lambdas. And then also we uh, have, uh, we measured their uh, estimated oxidative respiration rate by resulting transformation. This is a proxy of oxidative respiration. And then here, lambda is y-axis and the y-axis is a resultant transformation. And this means the higher, uh, uh, higher respiration rate and then uh, resultant transformation shows the negative correlation with the lambda. And this makes sense because lambda represents some dynamic inefficiency. Also here, blue and orange represent the samples from north and south. And then we already observed that uh, south samples uh, South uh, shows a higher respiration rate in comparison to North, and this explains well 
but we observe it from our, our field. And uh, as a next step, and I um, examined that how uh, actual reaction rate, not lambda distribution, but reaction rate, they can be predicted by these theories I talked about. And then, for example, oxidation, uh, oxygen consumption rate here, as I said, just multiply this stoichiometric coefficient uh, to biomass. And but this equation generally used for when uh, both carbon and oxygen are limited. But if carbon is present in excess, then actually this term, ox sorry, oxygen is present in excess, then this term is close to one, therefore we'll have a, this form, this is the equation extreme case when carbon is, only carbon is limited. Similarly, we can derive equation for the oxygen limited condition when organic carbon is present in excess. So um, to calculate or uh, estimate this oxygen consumption rate, we need to define these two terms actually, VH times organic carbon and VH times oxygen. So then this is a lump of parameters, of course, and then I've set here then two different cases, so weakly limited by putting, setting these two parameters one and then the severely limited case by putting lower values of these two. So higher and lower value of these terms means that either harvest volume becomes smaller or organic carbon concentration is lower. Same here, smaller harvest volume or organic the oxygen concentration becomes lower. So, um, this is now uh, oxygen distribution of a reaction rate or oxygen consumption rate in two sites and then same color and north and south. You can see now uh, high activity zone has a more or higher portion of uh, the oxygen consumption rate in comparison to lower uh, low activity zone when uh, carbon is limited. And then you can see that now positive correlation between predicted oxygen, predicted oxygen consumption rate versus resultant transformation. And when oxygen limited condition and this correlation is not really meaningful, you can see the for south data, you can see still positive correlation, but for north, there's a negative correlation. So overall, it shows positive, but if you look at the overall shape here and there, it's not really, uh, it doesn't show good correlation between these two variables. When carbon and both carbon and oxygen is limited and the correlation is still similar to the first case, but correlation is higher for a uh, carbon limited condition. And also from these di distributions that you can see that or clearly you can see a uh, high activity zone is a more portion for higher respiration rate for uh, from a high activity zone in here. Now, this is the second case I put uh, lower, lower the value of a VH times organic carbon and VH times oxygen. And <clears throat> interestingly, still under carbon limited condition, and I was uh, able to uh, observe a positive correlation between oxidative reaction and then a resultant transformation. But I don't see that it's actually negative correlation under oxygen limited condition. It's and you have five minutes left for your presentation. Uh, thank you, but uh, we uh, agreed to use this time like a flexibly. So um, I'll, so we'll. Okay. We agree to combine this lecture and then uh, to the presentation so that uh, I'll stop a little okay. bit after. Yeah, Sorry about that. Okay. And then, uh, but when oxygen is limited, you can see the correlation is actually negative and the range of oxygen is very small. So 10 to the minus two is here. When the carbon and oxygen both are limited, also same here, negative correlation and then range is small. Okay, so uh, we see that here, this is again the lambda dis distribution and then we, this is a reminder that Lambda as a negative correlation with resultant transformation. This means that 
actually uh, this reaction in, in our field, north and south, they are, they are biochemical reactions are driven by thermodynamics. So, but actually when we turn this thermodynamic parameter into reaction rates, actually um, we can see very different uh, result depending on what components are limited. On the carbon limited conditions, so we still see that uh, this, uh, by the way, the y-axis represent the respiration rate, the high activity zone to low activity zone, and then you can see dotted line is one. Therefore, there are so here's ca carbon oxygen consumption rate is above one, means that so lower uh, south side or high activity zone, we predict higher oxygen consumption rate for a uh, high activity zone. Also, uh, by growth rate, but not necessarily for other reactions like carbon elemental carbon consumption rate or bicarbonate. And this, no such thing is predicted when oxygen is limited and then oxygen and then carbon both are limited. This trend was in, in between. So this represents actually that uh, um, uh, possibility that the reaction, the data is driven by thermodynamics. Also, it shows the power of the theoretical analysis. We can use this formulation to see and then how this reaction rate changes under different uh, limited conditions, see that which condition really generate most plausible outcome, and then such that estimate how those uh, corresponding reactions are driven by uh, thermodynamics or other factors. Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, I talked about uh, the three components that drive the biochemical reactions and then the microbes and enzymes and substrate. And then this is the uh, earlier uh, model that uh, they considered lumped, lumped level of description of three, three components. But now we're having an uh, increasingly uh, large number of molecular data. Uh, our model, microbial ex explicit model or enzyme explicit model really great tool for incorporating those omics data, uh, 16S RNA and metagenome max and metatranscriptomics and metatromics. But now having substrate explicit model, we are also uh, incorporating metabolomics data. And then really we think hard how to combine them synergistically to, to define and then uh, develop integrative biochemical model. And this will improve their prediction and this is great platform and tool for uh, for reactive transport model and then uh, eventually the large-scale ecosystem simulations. Okay, um, let me uh, pause here then. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Would you like to get some questions, Yan? Yes, uh, but I... How I've been... I Sorry, what, what are you saying? How can I see the questions? Um, uh, I'll 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 read them to you. Um, I've been I've been compiling them as as things have been going. Just, uh, so here, this is a, a KBS narrative. I'll be talking about KBS narrative in the next session. But uh, if you have a already KBS accounts, just go this uh, address and then see you can while I'm going over there you can copy this narrative and then you can join uh, join me while I'm going over it. Go ahead James. Okay so um, actually first of all how long do you want to, the question answer session before you launch into your tutorial? Uh, up to 15 minutes. Okay okay so here's one. Um, doesn't this depend on the macromolecules that make up the cell? Leroux and Amen show that the energy of anabolism can vary widely in natural settings. Something has to do with the stoichiometry of, of the biomass, as I understand it, and how that influences the theory and calculations. Right, I, it'll affect definitely because I assume the fixed composition of a biomass, but uh, biomass varies, therefore it'll affect, but I don't know how much sensitively that uh, prediction will change, but if we know the biomass composition that vary in, in across conditions, it's a good idea to account for that. But uh, I remember that one paper said within 20% of variation, this effect is not very significant, but still uh, we need to check in the context of uh, combining uh, with uh, catabolic reaction, still we need to check. So 
I think that it's a good idea to get uh, exact biomass composition, see how it'll change the prediction overall. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's see, another question here. Um, as I see, there are three key equations. One is the sum, summation of coefficients times the species. Another is the summation of coefficients times number of electrons. The third is the equation defining the lambda. Can I understand these three equations to be derived based on mass conservation, electron conservation, and energy conservation concepts? That's correct. However, there are many ways to, to satisfy those mass and electron charge and then uh, those conservation. So this, that's why it's important to define the template components. When I started these equations, I already defined what nitrogen source, in this case, nitrogen sources I defined as ammonium. And by specifying those uh, nitrogen source and then electron acceptor, so forth, then by satisfying these three uh, conservation, yes, we can uh, uh, determine those coefficients as unknowns. Okay. Um, let's see, another question. Um, is the computation or for, computation for coefficients uh, for each species in the catabolic reaction or just Kramer's rule for reduction? Uh, would you uh, rephrase that again? I, what computation of what? Uh, the computation for the coefficients. Uh, is this computation for coefficients for each species in the catabolic reaction or just Kramer's rule for reduction? I think they're asking whether um, the computation is being done for every um, organic matter species um, that could be involved in a catabolic reaction, or is there some kind of simplification uh, that's going on? And maybe the person that posted that could clarify if I'm interpreting that incorrectly. Well, I, I understood that Kramer's rule, for example, that may facilitate that computation part, but I didn't use that. Uh, I have not deeply thought about it. I just uh, calculate them species by species, one, one component by one. It, it didn't take long, just it was very fast. So to calculate 10,000 compounds, just less than a few minutes, therefore it didn't take long. Um, but yeah, so that's an issue whether we need a, a more advanced computational algorithm for facilitating the computation or not. But that's a good, good point though, I, I, look at, I think about it. Okay, um, another question. Um, based on the previous presentation, such as that given uh, by Vanessa, uh, can we say that this approach is more aimed at carbon limited environments? And I know you kind of spoke to this a bit, Hyun, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit more. So actually this theory doesn't, is not limited to specific limited conditions like a carbon limited. So it can, it can seem, this is one of the power of this theory. We can simulate very different uh, situations, carbon limited, uh, oxygen limited, but we can add the nitrogen limited as well. And then how uh, double compounds are limited or all together they are limited. Because that depending on their limiting compounds and their level of limitation, the resulting uh, reaction rate will be different. We can uh, navigate how this prediction will change by such uh, diverse limitation. Which condition, limitation condition, gives the best uh, consistent prediction with our experimental observations. So I would say that this theory really support that what uh, Vanessa or our field uh, scientists observed and under what condition, for we already, this theory already predicted that under carbon limited condition, we, can, we already know that from this theory, also from observation and uh, the thermodynamics really drives the biochemical reaction or respiration reaction. But under oxygen, uh, under Either as the organic carbon concentration increases means that carbon is not limited anymore, then we lose that uh, trend. So this is very consistent between theory and experimental observation already. Okay. Um, another element here is um, wondering about, can you use the framework when organisms use inorganic carbon sources? And there was some exchange on Discord basically saying, yes, you can, which honestly, I didn't know that. Um, and uh, I think it was Britt that mentioned that some, there's some groups in the Netherlands and Belgium that are 
using this kind of a framework for inorganic carbon metabolism. Can you, do you have any thoughts on that, Hyun? Yes, uh, it is possible. So uh, in, in this framework, I have assumed that the uh, organic carbon, uh, the, the carbon source for anabolism is same as electron donor in catabolic reaction, but we can flexibly change that with any, any component. We can put that inorganic, uh, for example, uh, bicarbonate, we can put it bicarbonate as a carbon source for anabolic reactions. Actually, in my Lambda uh, code, R code or beta code, both contain already calculate those cases. What if that the uh, carbon source in anabolic reaction is inorganic? How it will affect the, if, if the overall uh, stoichiometry and reactions? So uh, if you run the lambda code, it generates a giant master table. The table has a specific column, the case where the inorganic carbon is used as a carbon source for anabolic reaction. Therefore, uh, it shows that all different uh, contexts and cases uh, but this is just typical example that uh, we, where we assume that carbon source in anabolic reaction is the same as electron donor in catabolic reaction. Okay. Another question. Um, how do you deal with substrates used via a co-metabolic pathway where there's not necessary, ne not necessary energy gain? The same question can be extended for detoxification pathways where there is a loss of energy but not a gain of biomass. So I think kind of moving away from sort of the, I don't know, sort of standard um, respiration kind of driven uh, metabolism is how I'm reading that. Uh, I've not thought about that much, but still I think uh, if that's true or relevant for specific systems, I think we can formulate properly and by putting that, we don't have to couple that uh, energy utilization as biomass production and there must be a way to separate them as relevant. So I, I think about it. That's a, that's a situation that is relevant and important, but I haven't thought about much. Okay. Um, let's see. I am looking in the chat and everything. Um, ah, here's a question. Um, ah, no, that was answered. I think that was answered. Uh, I think I hit the questions that I was seeing. Um, do people, if there are questions that I missed, uh, we have a couple more minutes. If you want to ask uh, Hyun any more questions, um, I'll give you just a moment here. Please write them into the Discord Metabolomics channel. I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I can see uh, at least one person is typing. So I'll give you just a few, few more seconds to get that in there. Otherwise, we will move on as we're waiting. Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, sorry, Becky, I, for I forgot to uh, communicate to you that Ken was going to use this uh, time a little bit more flexibly. That was my, my fault for missing that. Um, I think, as you know, uh, Hyun's going to go until uh, 2 o'clock with his tutorial. And then uh, Bob Danzak will – actually, I'll come back and say a few more things on logistics. Um, but well, I think we'll switch over, I guess, to the, uh, the student version. So, well, we'll see what questions come through, Hyun. Um, I think that, uh, okay, well, here's a question uh, following up. Would the energy used for detoxification be put into um, the Gibbs free energy of dissipation? Would that make sense, Hyun? As I think kind of a sort of a maintenance sort of energy yeah. in a way. And probably that is a contribution to dissipation energy. Um, and that will affect the amount of dissipation energy, but I, uh, I don't know whether uh, people has a way to quantitatively account for that uh, theoretically. But yes, I think that it will part of dissipation. Okay, very good. Um, well, would you like to go uh, on to your tutorial? Or do you want to wait for a couple more questions? I can move on. And then also uh, now um, before uh, opening up this uh, K-based narrative, I'll, I have also slides and then a uh, summary slide that what uh, we can do with K-based narrative. And uh, one day there's a K-based session and presentation. Therefore, I will be going over it again. 
And then this is the, we made a biogeochemical um, apps. Uh, most apps, all apps here I'm presenting today is made by Jun Yong Lee at PNNL. He's a great colleague and friend. And um, so our structure of a narrative is also simple. Then we uh, uh, use FTICL data as a molecular formula as an input file. And th this is generated by the formularity and R code by Bob Dangzak. And we uh, put this FTICL data file into the so-called staging area in Kbase. And then we then import that into the, uh, into the created narrative. And then this is the KBS app, also import TSV Excel file. And once it's in, incorporated into narrative, we can take that as input and we run, build by stoichiometric reaction models and from chemical formulas. And then we generate all the chemical um, thermodynamic properties of chemical compounds and then also react, have reactions, catabolic reactions, anabolic reactions, and metabolic reactions, everything also stoichiometric coefficients also show the same uh, different types of reactions. And key output files out from there is thermodynamic properties CSV and stoichiometrics oxygen CSV, meaning that this is when oxygen was used and uh, an electron acceptor. And then, um, uh, and this file should be downloaded and then uh, upload it again and then move to the staging area and import again. So this is a little bit inconveniency, however, and uh, to keep them automatically in the narrative, we have to define the objects, but this, this is something we have to discuss tightly uh, with the KBS team. Anyway, so by uploading this generate data, uh, thermodynamic and stoichiometric reaction, what we can do with it is three, three things actually. So we run lambda analysis app. This shows that we basic purpose of this app is to examine the correlation between lambda and the reaction rates. I have already shown that some of the examples how lambda can be correlated with the reaction rates under what conditions. And also we can use that because the, the, the final form of uh, biological model from this theory is that we have a kinetic equations. Therefore, we, are, we can perform like a dynamic simulation in a batch reactor or a continuous stir tank reactor. So we have a specific apps for that batch biochemical reaction model and the CSTL uh, reaction model. <clears throat> And this is the output when we run, generate thermodynamic properties and stoichiometric reactions. So you can see here lambda distribution from zero to uh, 0.3. Mostly it's rare to see that lambda value is greater than 0.3. And then this is their uh, uh, distribution. And then for a specific sample. And then here the delta G, COX naught, this is uh, uh, typically uh, used for evaluating thermodynamic efficiency favorability of a compound. Delta G C O X naught is uh, uh, gives free energy for uh, electron donor half reaction as standard condition pH is zero. <clears throat> also, you can compare the both, but meaning is the same. The lower value means that more favor favorable, larger val values are less favorable. And also automatically generate this bank travel and flow because the data file we have has an already classification of each compounds and uh, lignin protein and tannin and so forth. And then this colorful figure is automatically generated in k -base. And also this app generates uh, uh, like define lambda beans. Why do I uh, define lambda beans? Because eventually I want to use this output for, for dynamic simulation. So for example, the Altamaha uh, sub surface water and poor sample, we have uh, more than 10,000 compounds that have chemical formulas. So simulating 10,000, it is possible, but it takes longer, but sometimes we are not learning a lot by including all, all. So I think it's a good idea to start from a simplified set or subset of compounds, or we can just define like a representative compounds. So one idea to do that is that we divided the lambda based on into uh, discrete number of lambda beans. 
in this case, we use the cumulative uh, uh, distribution function, and then uh, depending on the cumul cumulative function, we can divide lambda space into 10 different uh, beans. And each bean has contains a similar level of uh, thermodynamic properties with respect to lambda. So, so lambda one contains these compounds, lambda two, lambda bean two, here and pin three and pin ten. Pin ten has a long tail, but actually, uh, it doesn't not contains a lot of compounds. This the scales are different from here. That actually, this is still tiny portion, uh, not tiny, but almost equal number of compounds there, and then uh, they are very comparable. So what we do here is that we identify their average chemical formula from each lambda bin. And then this is plot of their average chemical formula obtained from each lambda bin in van Cleveland plot. So oxygen to carbon and hydrogen to carbon ratio. And these are 10 uh, average molecular uh, formula obtained from 10 lambda beans. Interestingly, these compounds are representative of average compounds. They are not, they are not separated by H2 carbon ratio. There are some compounds that are separated here, bean 10, for example. However, most of, of them are separated by oxygen to carbon ratio. They are more sharply separate, separated by carbon along the oxygen to carbon ratio instead of hydrogen to carbon. And this figure is, uh, is comparison the, of the two cases where first we uh, calculate average lambda from each bean. This blue represents average lambda from each bean. In red, this is lambda derived from average chemical formula. So I hope that uh, uh, the audience uh, re recognize the difference between these two cases. And you can see here from bean one to 10, they are strikingly similar to each other. So we are use, going to use this lambda value derived from average chemical formula. And my take on this is that this chemical formula defining average chemical formula represent the thermodynamic properties uh, of the, the compounds in each bean reasonably well. And we have an option for, I'll talk about that again later, but we have an option whether we can use them like the original compounds, or we can select them through random sampling, or we can use representative compounds for dynamic simulation. Anyway, so second app is examine the relationship between lambda and reaction rates. And then um, for correlation, we don't have to specify mu max. Actually, we can divide, by both, divide both terms by mu max because correlation does, is not affected by scaling factor. And here, and then we now, two log primers, VH times organic carbon, VH times oxygen, and depending on their values we assign, it shows different correlation with lambda. We can see it's negative correlation when I put here uh, 0.5 for VH organic carbon means that this is moderate, moderately uh, limited. Carbon is moderately limited. And then 1.0 1, 1 oxygen means that this is weakly limited. So it's a carbon limited condition. So simply say carbon limited condition, we can see good correlation between lambda and ox oxygen consumption rate or biomass growth rate as well. But if you hear now carbon is very weakly limited here 1.0 and oxygen is moderately limited, uh, then the correlation disappears and oxygen con consumption rate is not really correlated by thermodynamic parameter lambda meaning that this oxygen consumption rate is not driven by thermodynamics. We can examine uh, their relationship like this, as I uh, discussed earlier. So actually, uh, we can develop based on this relationship, there's a three-dimensional figure and X and Y, actually this is VH times uh, organic carbon, oxygen, or the co their correlation between uh, lambda and respiration rate. But here we can see where, when the correlation becomes highest you can see, but uh, June suggests that we better look at two-dimensional heat map. This is more effective to quickly understand and when they are highly correlated. So I agree with that. So our app does not provide three-dimensional figure, but two-dimensional heat map. And then here you can see uh, this is a, a weekly uh, 
limited carbon and then highly limited carbon. And this is uh, uh, weakly limited oxygen and highly limited oxygen. When oxygen is highly limited, you, can, you cannot see very good correlation between uh, thermodynamic carbon lambda and oxygen consumption rate. But you can see for, for oxygen, oxygen is uh, moderately limited. You can see uh, high correlations observed when organic carbon is severely uh, limited. Actually, you can uh, connect this theoretical uh, analysis with the conceptual model that Vanessa and James talked about this morning. And then you can see increasing organic matter concentration means that this is this direction actually carbon is less limited. And then in this direction is more limited. When carbon is limited, thermodynamic limitation is a key control parameter that drives biochemical reaction rates. So actually this is an interesting experience that when I talk to field scientists and our collaborator experimental systems, their observation, I Sometimes I do not know their job, recent observation, but still we are talking about the same context. We are really agreeing with each other based on our analysis and experimental observations. And then perform the batch simulations and we can uh, simulate this uh, ordinary differential equations. And then I have considered here the oxygen dissolution because oxygen is continuously dissolved into media. And then here, this is term that how fast the oxygen can be uh, dissolved into the media. And then this is organic carbon term, oxygen and biomass. But I have introduced here cybernetic control variable U. This is a very, very important to make our prediction results uh, consistent and uh, reasonable. If you, if you don't have this, and then you will, will see that soon, but your uh, prediction on specific growth rate is not is unreasonably high. Anyway, the cybernetic model has been developed for more than three decades by Ram Krishna Group at Purdue University. And then the initial model was focusing on the predicting the, the dioxide growth, trioxic growth, and growth uh, on multiple carbon and nitrogen sources. When then glucose and nitrogen are both are present, microorganisms do not consume glucose and xylose together. They preferably consume glucose first, followed by xylose and resulting growth curve is like that. They grow first faster on glucose when glucose is depleted and they switch their enzyme settings from glucose to xylose through a leg phase and then start a balanced growth again. And then we also apply this concept recently to uh, the denitrification process. This happens not only for uh, multiple carbon sources but also multiple electron acceptors. So oxygen and then denitrate and nitrite and same, same phenomenon. Difficult to fit this data and purely based on kinetic models. And then we, this is simulation result and then you, by default, we take a 10 random uh, subset of compounds and this is time and this is dissolved oxygen and then uh, while reaction goes, goes on, oxygen content dissolved oxygen uh, level goes down and when up, uh, carbon source is depleted and then recovers the saturation level soon. And biomass grows and then after that and slightly, uh, 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 decreases by cell death rate. And you can calculate this as a specific uh, oxygen consumption rate and specific growth rate, as I said, without accounting for the cybernetic control, this level becomes higher and higher and becomes unrealistic. And same thing with the CSTL simulation. And then uh, only difference is that we have a feed term and then inlet and outlet term, and then we have a feed concentration and then also unreacted dissolved organic carbon and dissolved oxygen is removed from the reactor by this flow. And then uh, D is a dilution rate, this is a, a operating parameter. And we can also apply the cybernetic variables in this reaction as well. And then uh, results are here. Okay, and then um, in the narrative, we have used, uh, we have downloaded uh, on this data from ESS Live and particularly the Alta Hama data and the number of peaks is 22,000 and the number of compounds 10,000 and uh, this is narrative. For those who have KBase account and then this is uh, already shared in public and then you may see this you can copy it and then really to use it. So uh, this also guides our next tutorial session and the breakout session and the, I set up a lot of distinct questions, then 
uh, how what uh, each simulation or step by step implementation have a specific questions to address. And here, uh, first of all, you have to, as I said, uh, upload your data uh, to to your staging area. And then I already imp imported, but uh, my data is here processed at um, uh, 48 hour this. And then after uh, putting that in the staging area uh, at by dragging, drag and drop, and then I can import the data into narrative. But if you look at this setting, and then this data is here, job status, it takes 21 minutes, so it takes time. So I'm particularly big uh, metabolic data, and then I, I already uh, did it myself. And then, and then you can build, run this model. This is app, this is a beta, beta version. And to find this app, you have to click this R to B, and then you can search this uh, app by typing some of the words contained in this uh, description of the app. And then it really uh, doesn't take long, so four minutes. And the results is this. And results are like lambda, as you have already seen lambda distribution, I can click this to see them bigger. Lambda distribution and then delta CVX not, and then average value of lambda, average value of delta CVX not, and standard deviation, median value, and then uh, these 10 different uh, average molecular compounds and from 10 different lambda beans. And also, you can download a whole uh, numerical file and CSV, particularly thermodynamic properties file and stoichiometric coefficient file. These are input. You have to download them, and then you can upload them in the staging area again and import here. It's a little inconvenience, but this is this is a necessary step. And then you have to inco incorporate uh, first of all thermodynamic properties, and then a stoichiometric, and then now you're ready to run lambda analysis. And by running uh, this app, you can see, so different, oh, so before that, so I'll show how I set up my input parameter. So actually that this is the discrete points of VH times oxygen, VH times organic carbon. I put three val distinct, distinct values, 0.1 as strongly limited condition, 0.5 moderately, and one weakly limited condition. But you can put more values like 0 0.1, 0 0.22, and point nine point like one now what whatever you want to put them here then you can run yeah I don't remember how long it takes but may not that long and then by running this yes yeah, just one minute in this case because I for in, in total nine cases and the results is that so here then how uh, uh, this case is strongly limited and then both are strongly limited you may not see correlation. And then best way to do it, just you can look at these heat maps and where they find the good correlation here. And then oxygen, oxy, carbon is significantly limited, oxygen is not very significantly limited. So this case, and you, you see that a good correlation between some of the dynamics and then respiration rate. And then simulate a batch uh, reactor and this doesn't take long, but number of compounds, this is random sampling. We are not simulating 10,000 compounds initially. So to save our time, then we start from 10, but you can increase this value like 20, but still it's a random sampling. And then also uh, the beginners do not know necessarily the reasonable values, values of kinetic parameters. And then this is default parameters and show then you can see the, how reaction goes on and you can uh, change the values around these values, see how the model, the model simulation results will, will be different. And CSTL is the, uh, but important, okay, here, here if you look, click this show advanced, and there are some thing, carrying capacities here, but by default infinite because they don't grow a lot, therefore carrying capacity is infinite. And then ex, uh, oxygen saturation water, and it's not exactly 0.25, this is a mole per cubic meter or minimal per liter but you can change depend, this is a function of temperature, therefore you can also function of RPM speed, rotation speed, therefore you can put it into appropriate value for that. And volumetric mass trends. 
transfer rate also is a function of RPM. And then uh, I, I've taken this value from literature though. And then you can see all oh, simula simulation ends at, at 100 hours. And this is number of time steps in between. And then uh, random seed for, to get consistent result, we uh, put define what random seed we used. And then CSTL is very similar. And then, but there's additional parameters we have to put here. To, for example, dilution rate. This parameters was not in patch simulation, but now we have to put. So you, 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 it's important to look at the units. Most of the mistakes that the beginners uh, make would be a wrong uh, understanding of units, and then therefore the values, actual values, uh, are not appropriate because of the units are wrong. But anyway, so. Uh, CSTL and the results is this. And you can see clearly, oh, it's still um, not sure clearly, but we can see the one of the carbon is not really consuming initially because they are waiting because of this of cybernetic control law. And then this uh, compound is not preferably used in, in the beginning, but later is consumed when other compounds values their concentration become lower. And because of this regulatory effect, their, feed, their curves are not necessarily smooth, but there are some discontinuous change, uh, still continuous, but very non-smooth change can be observed. And also you can download all alpha files from here as a CSV files or uh, image file. And this is another simulation, but now instead of taking them as like a random sampling, uh, I have used the bean averages to document. So I have taken the average molecular compounds from each bean, 10 beans, for example, and then this is 10. And then simulation is you can compare how this, whether this can be representative of molecules for the entire uh, set of compounds or not. You can the compare, compare, compare the result. Uh, between two cases. And the same thing here is a CSTL also uh, comparison, but now I've taken bean average uh, the molecular uh, formulas for the simulation as a represented compounds. Um, in the, uh, in the, our tutorial, the hands-on session, well, well, I have generated, uh, pre-populated, and then uh, made an initial uh, narrative, and then we'll compare uh, at least two time points, and for the time point, we only, I have already made a full calculation and then students are required to see how the simulation results will change as a function of uh, temp parameter values and they will perform new calculation using a different time point data. So anyway, also for others who do not attend the uh, breakout session, still please look at this uh, uh, K-based narrative and then feel free to use them and uh, if you have any questions, just email me uh, for for a discussion and Q and A's. Um, I have ten minutes left, James. Um, do you have any? Did you get any questions? Uh, yep, yep. We've got some questions. Uh, are you ready to take some now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, can you explain a bit the meaning, physical or biological, of the mu function? in the batch model, cybernetic approach. Or, yeah. Yes, 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 that is a regulation. So actually, tomorrow I have a, a lecture on metabolic model landscape that I have a several slides for cybernetic model. This is you, uh, uh, that is my slide. So this is a, a control variable. So it's meaning that why then you, so this is a fraction of the gross uh, fractional consumption of a multiple among multiple organic carbons. So this is a typical characteristic of microorganisms. If this is a purely chemical reactions, multiple reactions occur simultaneously according to their intrinsic reaction rates. However, biological reactions are not like that. So microorganisms do not consume multiple organism, multiple carbon sources simultaneously, similar to human beings. If you have a multiple different delicious food, you may not eat them all simultaneously. You have to eat what you like the most and followed by the second you like, something like that. 
you have to eat them sequentially. Your eating capacity is not infinite. Similarly, that microorganisms cannot uptake them simultaneously. There's a, a limit. Therefore, this represents well that how microorganisms or microbial community environment, they preferably consume that organic carbon and then uh, nutrients that promote their growth the most. The microorganisms are very, they are not very smart, but their behavior is very smart. So they know what nutrients will lead to highest growth rate of their uh, biomass. So therefore they choose, in this case, glucose. You can see the slope here is growth rate is higher on glucose. When they grow on xylose, slope becomes slower. Therefore, that's why this organism class CLA they take glucose first, preferably, to, grow, to maximize their growth initially. When glucose is depleted, then switch over to xylose. Same thing here. This U variable will represent the, my, their regulatory behavior in taking up the, the organic carbon and nutrients uh, in an order of promoting their growth. Um, okay, let's see. So um, another question is, what are the batch and CSTR models supposed to represent? Are we modeling microbial populations in rivers or the degradation of hydrocarbons, et cetera? Physically, what are we modeling? So actually, uh, CSTL are often used for mimic really uh, field flow uh, conditions. And then, uh, for example, we can use CSTL often for uh, addressing the problem of such an inundation phenomenon, how the flooding will affect there. So it depends on how we set up uh, the equations. And batch reactor, on the other hand, is also often used in the confined uh, domain. And then it's, there's no input of flow much. Still under those limited conditions, those confined conditions, how set grows and then how the uh, nutrients grow. Also batch reactor is very useful for characterizing the growth rate because there's no input of flow. So we can ca identify the growth rate from batch reactor and then extrapolate the growth, the kinetic parameters for more complex uh, simulations. Therefore, we can synergistically use these settings much simpler than actual uh, uh, systems and in the field, but still uh, we can design them to, to uh, synthesize our hypothesis or to identify basic parameters. Okay. Um, let's see. So we still have a couple more minutes. Um, there's some questions from uh, from actually associated with your previous talk. Uh, I'll, I'll get to them now. So one of them is how do one deal with inhibitory effects of some compounds on microbial metabolism, such as the presence of oxygen on obligate anaerobes or other toxins? Right. So actually uh, we are in the right place because here you can see, we can see here that uh, you can see nitrate is there already initially, but nitrate is not consumed because of uh, inhibitory effect of oxygen. This is exactly how cybernetic control law plays a role. So we don't have to account for the inhibition by kinetical, by kin the kinetically, because we can do that. I mean, we can add the kinetic inhibition term there, but suppose that you are in your sample contains about thousands of compounds and carbon and nitrogen compounds. We don't know how they inhibit each other. Therefore, cybernetic model, really main goal of using cybernetic control variables to account for them automatically. Why then uh, nitrate is not conscious in this model? Because this, the, this model, cybernetic model, uh, identify oxygen is the most preferred electron acceptor. Therefore, it consumes use oxygen first, preferably, and then not using any other alternative electron acceptors until the most preferable electron acceptor is depleted. Therefore, it's automatic. I have not introduced any inhibition term here, but this fitting is very excellent in comparison to kinetic model. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we have a follow-up question on the batch reactor versus CSTR reactors. And that is, so, so would those be modeled experimentally as well and used to define parameters for specific microbes or populations of microbes? Oh. I don't think I understood the question correctly, which is say that one more time. Well, so it's asking, would it be modeled experimentally? So I take that to mean, um, would the reactors uh, 
be interrogated uh, through physical experiments. And I presume, uh, um, oh, so, or rather fit to experimental batch tests. Um, so basically doing actual physical experiments um, and using the outcomes uh, to uh, define parameters that are tied to specific uh, groups of microbes, uh, maybe in a functional trait way, for example. They didn't say that, but I'm just inferring that. So for example, kind of stuff that the own Brody was talking about yesterday. Right. I think it's possible because the, uh, one of the good advantages of using this batch was is that we assume that we realize homogeneous, we occur to homogeneous condition. So we, without having to worry about, worry about the transport limitation, because that our observation is the compounding effect of transport limitation and intrinsic biological processes. Therefore, this homogeneous setting really excludes so any uh, additional issues caused by transport limitation. And then when we identify the like, interactions among, still this setting is useful, better than uh, starting from like uh, spatially heterogeneous uh, reactors. That is a more realistic, but difficult to identify intrinsic parameters. So probably strategically, we can start using this homogeneous reactors batch and CSTL, and then uh, identifying the interaction parameters for binary consortium is much more challenging than single parameters, but uh, we can start from single organism and then increase the complexity by adding uh, additional organism and see how data becomes different and, and progressively we can improve the accuracy of parameters. We need a designable experimental uh, strategies for that. Um, interesting. So Ray is asking, are we going to cover that? Um, in the any of the tutorials or anything. Um, I don't think we're doing that today. Uh, I'm trying to think for the agenda for the rest of the um, summer school. Um, I don't think there's an element that's tied to um, sort of linking to physical experiments. Uh, Tim, maybe you can, you probably have a better holistic sense of the agenda and all the topics than I do at the moment. Um, do you have thoughts on that? Oh, the yeah, extension I, of more complicated. Oh, maybe it's here. Sorry, the extension of more complicated transport models is what they're referring to. Yeah, I might, the answer is yes. I might touch on that a little bit in my talk this afternoon, but you know, the idea of that, how we would do that, I, I don't think we're, you know, the pipeline hasn't really developed yet to the point where we're actively doing much more complicated than maybe a one D column type of simulation. Um, but certainly, that's things we're thinking about, and we'll talk a little bit about those. Okay. Um, Ray says, great, cool. Um, let's see. So, okay. Oh, we're actually out of time. Um, I will see if we can get to that question maybe later. So with that, I think we're going to close this part. Um, please uh, rejoin us at, let's see, 4.15 for Tim just mentioned he's giving a presentation. Uh, we're going to pop over into the, the hands-on student session from now until then. So uh, for those students, we'll see you over there. And everyone else, thanks very much for joining us and look forward to hopefully seeing you a little bit later today.